So after doing a deep dive into the MBTA community's law, the subject is so vast and there is so much more to talk about than I can get into the package. We have WBZ's John Keller here to talk about the political history of this, the implications. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Good to see you. This is good. Good to see you too. So I should say right off the bat, which surprised me because a lot of people ask me this, this is not about low income housing. This is, this is for developers to build market level for sale condos, apartment buildings, just multifamily housing in all of these various communities that are on the map that you saw in the package. So looking back, why do you think that's an important focus? Of this? Well, the, the, the key word here that all the bureaucrats use is affordability. Right. Okay, so. That if there, there's more housing, prices should come down. Well, right, and there may be some communities where some of these new units, in theory, would be set at affordable rates. But again, affordable doesn't necessarily mean that low-income people can afford it. Mm. Affordable can mean a lot of Maybe different that, things. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have a terrible shortage of affordable housing. Uh, talk to any young person. I sit next to one back in the newsroom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she and her husband are just going through a nightmare yeah. of trying to buy their first home. They, they mm -hmm. both have good jobs. They've saved money for a down payment. But uh, the competition for anything is intense. People are bidding way over. And it feels like there's this whole downhill effect where baby boomers aren't selling their suburban big family home because there's nowhere for them to go. Right. So then the young couple having babies can't find a house, right. like a young couple like that. And then you have, uh, I know there was that statistic that came out this week, it's actually cheaper to rent now than to buy anywhere in America. Right. Um, and you've got young people paying through the roof for apartments and around here, unlike New York City, you have to own a car. And as a result, they're fleeing. Right. They're leaving so the leave. state. A uh, recent study uh, about Boston showed that 25% of young people who may go to school here or whatever mm -hmm. are turning right around and leaving because of this housing crunch. And, and um, that's a significant number. Like one in four is a lot. Oh, that's, you know, that's your seed corn of the future. Yeah. Uh, so it's a terrible problem. No one disputes that. No. No. Uh, the state estimates we need to generate two, we're 200,000 mm. affordable housing units short in this state. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that number becomes really significant when you look at the paltry yield that some of the efforts so far to stimulate affordable housing have produced. Right. So that's sort of the, ba the, 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 the macro backdrop to of the, the MBTA communities. And law. then when the law was passed by the legislature, you know, Democrat controlled legislature passed this law in 2021. Republican it was implemented governor. Implemented by a Republican governor. Yep. This has bipartisan support. As Big you time. say, yep. no one argues with the statistic that we do need to build more housing. But then when you get into the nitty gritty of the law, of course, the devil is always in the details. So there are 177 cities and towns that are on this map that our viewers will have seen in the story. Um, it makes sense for Arlington, right? Or a lot of places that are right near Boston or that have a clear commuter rail, Natick. Mm -hmm. But then there are other communities out there, some of which we talked to, like Holden, like Arentham, and they're pushing back a little bit and saying, well, wait a minute, you can't hold us to the same standard as some suburb of Boston that is so close. What do you think about that argument? Well, uh, listen, there, there are a million different stories out there. A lot of the communities that are deemed to be covered by the community's law mm. don't have the T in them, but they're adjacent to a community right. that does. They're the town next door. Right. So, I mean, and this, uh, uh, if people take a close look at that map, I mean, this extends out, I think, believe Princeton. Right. Uh, right. Out way out there mm -hmm. along Route 2 is at the, the western yeah. end of this map. And so, I should say, just to reiterate, the law says that if you are a community in Massachusetts on this map that has public transit, right. either right in, near your town or in your town, um, within a half mile of that public transit, you have to zone... Right. for the ability to have multifamily housing built suitable for families. Yeah. There's all kinds of acreage involved and we don't, you know, nobody can get into those tiny numbers. But it essentially says if, if you have access 
to public transit, you have to do A, B, and C, or you're not going to get these specific state grants. So there was a little carrot put out there. By the, oh, by absolutely. The and you mentioned the magic word, zoning. Mm. First of all, this doesn't require that these units be built. Right. Nothing has to be built right now. Right. It just uh, prohibits or cracks down on a practice called exclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of our viewers have heard the term nimbyism. Not in my backyard. The attitude of, well, I have a home in this nice leafy suburb mm -hmm. and uh, I don't want uh, multifamily units coming in. There was one classic case, it's probably, I think it's still going on, in Weston, mm. one of the most wealthy bucolic communities uh, in uh, the greater Boston area uh, where there was a proposal to build uh, multifamily housing, mm -hmm. and, and this is a community that falls well under the state target for affordable availability of affordable housing, and uh, it, opponents rallied around and deemed it the Weston Whopper, <laughs> and they put up signs all over town showing this giant cartoon high-rise apartment high building, building with a snarl on its <laughs> face, like it's coming to, you know, eat you alive. Very effective. And, you know, so this is NIMBYism mm. in action. Now, NIMBYites are not always without an argument to make. Sure. And we can talk more sure. about that as this goes yes, on, we Paula. Will. But we will. Like, that, for instance, one of the um, selectmen I spoke with said there are no height restrictions mentioned in this law. So you can see where people in a colonial town are concerned that some big concrete building is going to go up in their cute little train station. You don't want anything to happen that's going to hurt your property values. Right. Exactly. That's going to overburden your local schools or your local sewer system. Yep. Th those are, those those are, those are valid concerns. But uh, a part of this, I remember uh, then Governor Baker really celebrating a part of this law uh, ruled that a, uh, a local governing body, Board of Aldermen, mm -hmm. uh, selectmen, uh, uh, can pass this new zoning, more inclusionary zoning, with a simple majority vote, as opposed right. to the two-thirds they used to need, they thereby sure lowering the bar for this stuff to occur. They changed that rule. Yeah. Right. That so was, was big. Just a simple majority. And we'll take a quick break and uh, come back right after this and talk a little bit about some of what the Commonwealth is trying to avoid here. I have John Keller. We're talking about the MBTA Communities Law, and we'll be right back. So we're back with John Keller talking about the 2021 MBTA Communities Law. The reason it's a big talker right now is by the end of this year, by December 31st, all of the communities involved have to pass this town vote, which essentially what they're voting on, John, is which parcels in their town they will declare open to building right. for multifamily housing, not that they approve of the law. That's, that's already happened. This is happening. They have to adjust their zoning rules adjust their zoning to rules. allow for this multifamily unit development. And you had just mentioned, and I do think it's interesting, when you talk to people in the towns that are involved here, what this law accomplishes is shaving several years off the kind of fights that people often have in these individual towns uh, with the local zoning board. You know, you've always got that one person or a couple of people that hold everything up in your community and they're trying to say no more of that. Right, right. You know, and, and, that, and that's a big, heavy lift. And there are a lot of reasons. Uh, there's a whole genre of nimbyism mm. Uh, that there's a term for it, I'm, I'm blank on exactly what it is, but it has to do with people who base it mainly on environmental mm, yes. objections. You know, so th these so are not... your local conservation commission can hold things up for years. Yeah, and, and people in many cases, not without reason, mm -hmm. are pointing to the sewerage requirements. Yeah that these new multifamily developments place on a community. And the expense would go on the builder, right? You typically, it's, a, it's gonna be the builder's problem to, to do it, like not the town, but there are big issues right. with sewage. Right, because not every town has the sewage treatment facilities. Mm -hmm. Those are extremely expensive. And, you know, the bottom line is too, in the end, uh, the state government floats bonds and spends money to help build housing. Mm. But uh, no one argues that the state can build our way out of this. It has to come from the yeah. private sector. And the, f the problem with that is 
when the costs outweigh the benefits, right. when there's no profit to be made, that kind of construction is not going to happen. Exactly. And in the end, I think that that cold, hard economic reality is going to be the biggest single impediment to the MBTA community's law working the way it was supposed right. to. You interviewed the governor recently, and yeah. she talks about how important it is to enforce this. It's got to yeah. be done. Yeah. Let's talk about the Milton lawsuit, because yeah. I think it might be confusing for people. So Milton is one of those communities that looked at which parcels of land, because they have the trolley that runs from Mattapan through Milton, but they don't have a big commuter rail station. Uh, but they were included. And when it came to the town vote, they voted no, even with the simple majority. Right. And so the attorney general is suing Milton and saying, no, you don't get to just decide you're not going to obey the law here. So now it's in the hands of the Supreme Judicial Court right. in the fall. What do you think is likely to happen? Boy, that is a loaded question. It's tough. Because some people think it's unconstitutional to take the zoning control away from the local authorities. And there's the issue of the punitive side of this, the yes. stick, yeah. to go along with the carrot. And by the way, the state is floating a $4 billion bond issue to help fund these projects. So it's not like they're saying, come on, you guys better do this, and we're not going to lift a yeah. finger to help. Most communities have gone along with revamping yes. their zoning. Yeah, the vast but, majority But many are have not. And so, uh, you know, I certainly can't read the minds of the mm. Supreme Judicial Court justices, but there's a lot of buzz up on Beacon Hill that this might not go the state's way. No. That there are a lot of issues raised here about local control, about the use of the, the punitive power that the state mm -hmm. is, is making use of here. And um, if they throw it out, you know, right. we're back to square one. Right. And but yeah, no, go, go. Even if they don't, Paul, yeah. the problem is, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Boston mm. is ha has a terrible affordable housing Right, front. and they're exempt from this. They are exempt from this for a variety of reasons, but, uh, well, they, are, they already meet you know, a lot housing. of these targets. But still, it's hard to find affordable homes oh, in yeah. Boston, very hard. And um, so, uh, at the same time, the collapse of working from the office yes. uh, since the pandemic, people, the remote work, it appears, is here to stay, mm -hmm. has cratered the downtown Boston commercial office market. Yeah. They went from zero vacancy rates to more than 20% vacancy rates, and there's all sorts of concern about that. Uh, uh, Mayor Wu has been promoting the idea of converting some of these essentially abandoned buildings into housing. Mm. Um, and they started up a program this past fall, opened it up for applications from developers. You get all sorts of tax incentives right. to go ahead and do it. They've had a handful. Yeah. It, well, and You're also, talking about maybe 200 plus units. That's right? nothing. So many of those commercial uh, buildings are owned by companies that use that empty building as a write-off. So yeah. they have no incentive to turn it into housing. They right. can hold on to that for years till the market comes back and they still get a benefit from it even though it's empty. And again, it's expensive to it's convert expensive. them. It's expensive. This is all so expensive. But when you talk to... Um, uh, I, I talked to a selectman in Westwood, yeah. which is a town, you know, a suburban town around Boston with the big University Avenue station. They're a little concerned about all the school issues, the infrastructure. Every town will say, we don't have the infrastructure. What are we going to do about that? But Westwood is making it work, mm -hmm. and, and they've done a good job. Yeah. When I talked to the town manager in Holden, this is one of these colonial towns. He'll tell you, even he doesn't think they should be included at all. It's bizarre they don't have a train or even a bus. Um, and to walk from the center of Holden to the closest train station in Worcester is a 10 mile walk. So that's not exactly a walkable downtown. Right. So there are some times, it seems to a lot of people you talk to, the SJC is gonna have to send it back to the legislature for some amendments for communities like that to say, Holden is not Milton or Arlington, right? I mean, I, I, I wonder if they'll be open to adjusting the law for you know, communities like I, that. I'm not a lawyer, yeah. and I don't play one on no, TV, no, no, no. so I can't, <laughs> I can't really analyze yeah. all the, the mm. fine legal points of this, but uh, yeah, it, it, to a lot of people, it looks like a top-down mandate mm -hmm. coming from 
the stay. From Boston. Uh, yeah, from Boston. And again, and that also speaks to another issue here, uh, Paula, which is the historic tension on policy issues between the suburbs yes. and the city. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, think back to the, the big dig and, and how chafed uh, oh, yeah. a lot of suburban residents were to have to be have paying to pay for, for that. For when they never tolls. use it. Oh, yeah, right. up on Cape Ann has a group, uh, anti-MBTA communities law, called Don't Boston My Cape Ann. Yeah. Like, I'm there living here for a reason. Yeah. I didn't want to live in a really busy area with lots of buildings. So right. there's a long way to go. It's a tough one. Mm -hmm. and and, you know, uh, I don't think there's any uh, cookie cutter evil villains here. Right, no. Uh, the state, Governor Baker, mm -hmm. now Governor Healy. Yeah, Mike, Mike Keneally, who came up with the guidelines. They're trying group. to do the right they thing. Are. Mayor Wu is trying to do the right thing. Yeah. But the economics and the politics of this are brutal. We are in really uncharted territory. Yeah. And we're preparing young people now for a world that we don't even know what it's going to look like 10 or 20 years from I hope now. you're showing our online viewers the piece you did about... Yeah, yeah, yes, this okay, is Okay, they already saw that. That's attached. Okay. And uh, you can see, Mike Keneally says, you know, th this is a crisis. It's a housing and financial crisis. And just look at what happened to the boroughs of New York in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the overbuilding that ended up happening there. I, yeah, I think some people fear that, but you still can't have an economic engine without young people staying and having the ability to live here. And you have to, at some point, think about what kind of place you want Massachusetts to be. Yeah. Is it a place where multiple generations of a family can co live together or in the same okay. general area? Are we going to be a place populated by just the old, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the rich and the poor, yeah. the old and a few... Uh, of, uh, uh, of middle-aged people because young people can't afford it. I mean, that's a grim prospect. It's not pretty. Well, yeah. John Keller, thanks so much for all of your knowledge and expertise, and uh, we'll keep covering this right through the SJC ruling in the fall.